again, I'm Doug from Dynamic Computing, and normally I have nice, boring presentations about antivirus software and security and hardware. Um, well, it's kind of a snooze fest sometimes. Huh? So this time I wanted to talk about something else that I do that I'm very interested in, and that is retro computers. Huh. Uh, we've all got stories about how we got involved in our industry. I've been in the computer industry for 25 years. And it started out when I was 11 years old, just a, a wee kid back in 1981. My cousins and I uh, and my mother were out at a county fair in Illinois, and I saw a little white computer hooked up to a television. Someone was demonstrating, and it had a game playing on it, and I'm just my jaw dropped in amazement. I, you know, at home I had the old Atari 2600. I'm sure you guys, a lot of you guys had those. I still have mine too. Um, <laughs> But the thought of owning an actual computer, something I could actually program, something I could make my own programs on, just blew my little 11 year old mind. So after a lot of uh, begging and finagling, my mother agreed that we could get one. So uh, I would say it's late 81, maybe early 82, I got my first uh, Commodore VIC-20, which is this little beauty right here, we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, and I used my VIC-20 for several years. I uh, had a tape drive on it. You know, once you key in all these programs, then you have to save them onto a tape, which was, was always exciting because it took forever. <laughs> you know, or you get a new program, you put the tape in, you, you, you hit load, and then you wait 10, 15 minutes for it to load in. It's, it's not kind of the instantaneous thing that, uh, that we're using. Then in uh, probably 1984, 1985, I uh, upgraded to the Commodore 64, which I'm sure everybody recognizes. You probably either had one or knew somebody who had one back in the day. And the Commodore 64 still holds the world's record for the best-selling computer of any computer ever. Now, and and that is, you know, you you have. A, a Macintosh computer, and then three years later they came up with a different Macintosh and it's upgraded a different one. But for an actual model of a computer, they've sold uh, over 17 million of them, wow. and uh, it's still the, the world's record for the best selling computer. Wow. And here's a funny thing you can still buy brand new Commodore 64s today. People have built uh, kits where all you have to do is put a couple of your own chips in, brand new Commodore 64. They have this thing called the C64 Mini, which is a little tiny thing that looks exactly like a Commodore 64 that you can play a bunch of the old games on, and you can program and basic on. It's like 50 bucks. You can get them at Walmart. They're, they're incredible. Um, it was on the market from 1982 until 1994, when Commodore sadly went out of business. Uh, after that, I moved on to the Commodore Amiga, which I won't be talking about today, the best computer of all time. And I continued to use my, my Commodore equipment uh, up until probably 95, 96, 97, when I got my first uh, real PC. Uh, so I've always had a soft spot in my heart for this old equipment. Uh, but once the 90s rolled around, most of it just went in a closet, a storage unit, and uh, some of it disappeared over the years. And then uh, last year, I got this little bug to get some of my old equipment out. I pulled some of my old equipment out of the closet and started doing research on it. And none of this equipment I owned last year. This is all brand new stuff. And I got online and I started realizing there's an absolutely huge community of people who are still collectors of this old retro equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of it like a group of, the, the group of people that goes around town showing off their funky hot rods that they create. You see them around town every once in a while. All of these people talk to other people online from all over the world, and, and, and sooner or later you have this huge community. So I was trying to think of a way that I could become a part of this community and contribute to it. Uh, so what I did is I decided to uh, start up my own YouTube channel. Uh, it mainly based on the Amiga, which again I'm not talking about today but also a lot of this old Commodore 8-bit equipment. It's called uh, the 10-Minute Amiga Retrocast. <laughs> and I now have uh, 
1,200 subscribers and over 43,000 views on my videos just in the past year. And uh, it just keeps growing all the time, hundreds of new subscribers a month. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. And I've met people from all over the world. I have friends in Germany now, I have friends in England, friends in Poland, friends in South America that you start communicating with on these different forums and these different groups. And they see my channel and they, you know, get in touch with them. They email me with questions. Well, how do I do this? How do I do that? And, you know, and when I say friends, it's the kind of people where, you know, if I call, if I call them up and said, hey, I'm going to be in Germany for two weeks. Can I crash at your pad? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Bring some of your equipment with. So it's been a really great experience. And uh, just a little bit of what I do here. That looks that looks too current for me. Yeah. <laughs> I actually enjoy using uh, my older equipment more than I do my new stuff. So there's that handsome devil right there. And uh, and they stock a lot of nice Amiga hardware. So please take a look at their site. Now it's called 10 minute Amiga retrocast because I intended on making all my videos 10 minutes long because I never really like watching the long videos. None of them are 10 minutes at all. 20, 25, 30, 35 minutes. <laughs> so everyone online teases me about that. You know, 10 minutes of my foot. That, <laughs> but, but they watch them all. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about some of these computers. The Commodore VIC-20, again, came out in 1981. It wasn't Commodore's first computer. Their first real computer was the PET, which were, you may have seen them in your schools when you were kids. They were all in one metal cases with a monitor built in, white with a keyboard built in. Beautiful computers. But uh, Commodore, the owner of Commodore at the time, was concerned that the Japanese were going to come in and take over the computer market with low priced computers. So he wanted to get a jump on it. <laughs> so he had his people come up with the, the Commodore VIC 20 with a full keyboard, full color graphics, and nice sound, and a whopping five kilobytes of memory. Wow. Now, now, five kilobytes of memory, if you look on your smartphone and you see an icon, just a little picture. Of, of one of your apps on your smartphone, that's probably 20 times the memory of this entire machine. You know, it, it's unbelievable. You know, your, your, your watch that you have on, if you have a smartwatch, has about a million times more memory than this. But it was so much fun. It, it did things that no other computer could do at the time for a $300 price tag when it was first released. Now, you could get an IBM PC uh, back in 81 for about $5,000, okay, with a nice green screen and a little speaker that could go bang, maybe, you know, if it, came this, if it came with a little speaker inside. Absolutely no fun at all. You know, great for spreadsheets, but not any fun at all. For $299, Commodore came up with a machine that could do almost as much as a PC could, plus it had fantastic graphics. Uh, for the time, again, now this is, uh, you know, this stuff looks kind of silly, but for the time, it was absolutely incredible. Let me just uh, bring a little something up here. There we go, and you guys will recognize this. You know, so as a kid in uh, 1990 or 1981, being able to enjoy something like this on your own home machine was pretty darn incredible. Oh, look at that, I just got eaten. <laughs> but you get the idea that, that uh, you know, this was unheard of. And try doing this on your old black and white or your green screen IBM PC in 81 for 300 bucks. And it's not going to happen. <laughs> now, amazingly, this VIC-20, today there are still hard, there's still hardware being made for it, brand new hardware, still brand new games being made for it. I have a, a friend in Canada uh, who 
just created a new game for it. It comes on four of the uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Oh, five and a quarter inch disks. Oh, yes. oh, oh, yeah. 170 <laughs> kilobytes per side. A brand new adventure game that he's selling for 40 bucks. And he sold 1,000, 2,000 copies of it. It's incredible. Uh, and as far as hardware, this I just brought back uh, brand new for some people in, uh, in England. It's a little cartridge that holds about uh, 50 or 60 games uh, that used to be available on tape or on floppy. They put them all in a digital cartridge plus a bunch of memory expansion in here. You know, $60, $70. He sells hundreds of these, hundreds of them. So still today, there's even a market for this kind of thing. Now, next came the famous Commodore 64. Again, everybody's seen it, everybody's heard of it. The graphics on this were such an enhancement over the VIC-20 and everything else in the market. Such an enhancement. But almost as importantly, the audio on here is so unbelievably incredible. It has a little chip in it called the SID chip. And even at the time, in 1982, when this came out, the Commodore didn't know what they had in their machine. They didn't realize how powerful it is. The music quality that you can get out of this chip, the synthesized instruments you can get out of it, people are still writing music for the Commodore 64 and releasing it on CD or on MP3. And there's a whole little sub-niche uh, market of people who create music for this little 35-year-old computer. Sounds absolutely beautiful. Um, I'll show you some audio on it in a minute. In the early 80s, early to mid 80s, Commodore was selling more computers and making more money selling computers than Apple and IBM combined. It's just incredible. They were so huge back in the day. And today, people don't really think about them being pioneers in the computer industry. You know, it's, oh, it's Apple, IBM, Apple, IBM, Apple, IBM. Well, no, Commodore was right there, and they came out with this stuff before anybody else did. Wow. Now, next. I have a question oh, about those. I'm not familiar with those. My parents couldn't afford computers, so, um, and I didn't know anybody who had them. Is everything in there, like the hard drive and the video cards and all of that stuff? Or? Video, audio, uh, are all right on the machine, in the memory. Storage, you either use a tape drive, which you plug in. I didn't bring my tape drive today. Or you plug in an external drive, like this is uh, an external three and a half inch drive. These were later on in Commodore's life. But most of them, and they sold millions and millions of them, were the five and a quarter inch drives like this. This is mainly what it was. Those disk drives actually cost as much or more than the computer did usually. But, uh, you know, they had added so much storage and made it so much easier to access everything. Lots of people. So this little beauty is the SX-64. This came out in 1984, and this is Commodore's portable computer. And when I say portable, is 22 pounds, so <laughs> no battery, but it was unheard of at the time. People had K-Pros, people had Osborne computers, which looked similar to this, but they were all green screen or amber screen. Commodore 65, SX64 actually has a full color 5-inch screen right on here. This is a 35-year-old computer. The darn screen's still working perfect for me. And has this cool keyboard that just clips right on the front. And the whole thing like comes totally and completely. Yeah. Well, take it up, you can then fold the handle up and just carry the thing around with you. Wow. It was the actually, <laughs> I just lost my game. It was the first portable computer with a color screen uh, that ever was sold. The very first one. <laughs> this that I'm plugging in there right now is a game that another friend of mine made, uh, actually on Carter. So even below is red there, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> but I want to use it to show you what this little thing can do. Um, it has its own 
speaker built right into the computer. You can see the graphics on there. And the audio quality, if you can hear the audio, you couldn't do anything even close to this on a PC until the late 80s when they come out with these hundreds of hundred dollar cars that you could put in there. Does it have a joystick too? Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> right here, joysticks plug right into it. Yep. Um, so, by putting in a, a built in five and a quarter inch drive, your own built in screen, and the only thing you need to take with you is the power cable, which folds up nicely and fits right in that little storage bay right there. You can take this with you to your so business sure meeting. Sure. And it, it's beautiful, beautiful color on there. Uh, most people think, ah, it's too small to do anything with. But I can type on there and see everything absolutely beautifully, you know, because you're sitting in front of it while you're doing it. So, uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. These sold for about $1,000 uh, new uh, back in the 80s, and they were available for about 30 years from now. So, lovely machines. And you did everything on them with the keyboard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no mouse on these. No mouse. Now, you can get a mouse, which I'll show you in this one in a few minutes. You can use a mouse on it, but everything's keyboard driven. And everything is in basic when you first turn it on. The old basic programming language where you come up with a ready prompt and you just start typing your own programs in. Or loading them in from tape or loading them in from this. But yeah, you generally interact with just by typing on it. Kind of like you did an MS DOS machine if you're around for those days. Now, Douglas, Ben said it's about a thousand dollars. If we were to compare that to a system today, what would that price be in today's? Probably about $3,500, wow. $4,000. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was back in the day. But its competitors, like uh, Compact, came out with a uh, portable machine similar to this uh, a year or so later, I think in 85, and you get into that, and the cheapest one was $2,800, $3,200 for the absolute cheapest one. And I'll be honest, it still couldn't do color graphics. And it had, you know, you couldn't play the games on it, it didn't have any audio. So, in a lot of ways, it was just good for business software. Which is fine. There's, and there was a ton of business software for the Commodores, too. You could do word processing, spreadsheets, no problem at all. Now, then Commodore made a mistake a, a year or so later, and they came out with this absolutely gorgeous little computer. I think this is about the cutest little thing in the world. It's an all-included machine called the Plus 4. It had built-in application software. You hit a button and it would launch a word processor or a spreadsheet or a database program that you could use. It had more usable memory than Commodore 64 did. But they made it so it was not compatible with the Commodore 64. So at the time, here they are with, with uh, you know, 8 million Commodore 64s out there in 1984, 1985. And they come out with this. And people say, oh yeah, new Commodore machine. It's got a little better graphics and none of my software will work on it. Nah. And they just, people literally just passed on it. And it was overpriced too. These were about uh, uh, $3.99 when they came out. And at that same time, you could buy a Commodore 64 for $130, $140. Right? So everyone has said, what's the point? The sound isn't as good. It's not compatible with the games. Why bother? But I personally think it is probably one of the most attractive little computers that I've ever seen. It's just, you know, it's just a lovely little thing. And it works perfect. I hook it up and I use it quite a bit. They ended up selling these off in like infomercials, you know, midnight, you're watching TV and the infomercial comes out. Initially offered at $3.99. Now it can be yours for $99. That kind of thing. And so they dumped them all on the on the market after they realized they weren't going to sell. They just lowered the price and they just. You know, they had infomercials. Yeah, I'm sure they on the show. Yeah, they were selling sneak oil forever. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God I didn't know about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were selling sneak oil forever. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Valley National Bank, that's how long it was. It's computerized payroll. And nobody had computers at home. So we did all everybody's payrolls and wow. opened up all the restaurants in town. Great job. Oh, a lot of fun. You know who Jamie Hernandez is? Don't worry about that. <laughs> you know who Jamie Hernandez Valley one? Way back. That's a good, yeah. This is back in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> the last machine I want to talk about is the Commodore 128. This came out in about 1985, and it was the next logical successor to the Commodore 64. Commodore had learned their lesson about incompatibility on this machine and decided they were not going to make it incompatible. So while it would normally boot up in Commodore 128 mode with 128 kilobytes of memory instead of the 64 kilobytes of this one. And again, at 85, that was almost unheard of on a home machine, you know. Wow, 128K, what are you going to do with that? But they were smart, and they also built in this mode where you pull down a button and you boot it up, and it boots up in 100% Commodore 64 mode. So everything that you'd invested in all those years in Commodore 64, all your games, all your programs, it worked absolutely perfectly on the Commodore 128 because you just hit a button and it boots in between the modes. Now it also had a third mode, and we'll see how old some of you are here. Has anyone heard of the CPM operating system? That came out before MS-DOS. Uh, uh, Digital Equipment Core came out with it in the 70s. And it's the predecessor to what we used in the 80s under MS-DOS. It was a disk operating system that ended up on the K-Pros, the Osbornes, the TRS-80s. Tons of other machines that were out at the time used the CPM operating system. So there were literally thousands of programs that were available for it. So Commodore built in a chip in here that would allow it to run CPM in addition to Commodore 128 mode and in addition to Commodore 64 mode. So you really have three computers in one. Literally, you can run three different operating systems on this just by hitting some buttons here. Uh, now, unfortunately, CPM was kind of at the end of its useful life in 85, 86. It was starting to lose market share to MS-DOS. So it was not maybe as uh, useful as Commodore hoped, but they still did get a lot of use out of it. Now in 86 and 87, a new operating system came out for the Commodore machines called the GEOS, G-E-O-S. And it was a full graphic operating system, mouse-driven, Windows. Uh, I mean, it looks familiar, doesn't it? This was 1987 that this came out on the Commodores. They started bundling it with a lot of the Commodore machines. And it could do a lot of things that your Macintosh could do. It had nice, beautiful fonts. It had a full word processor built right into it. You can see it boots up pretty fast off of a nice uh, 1581 drive here. It had a nice graphics drawing program on it. And it was just unheard of. Nobody ever thought an old 8-bit machine with 64K of memory or 128K of memory could run a graphics operating system like that. And they sold millions of them. I even had this Geos operating system. I hooked it up and ran it out here one time. So if you can imagine using a mouse and controlling everything, then that needs to be a bit of a challenge. You know, wait, okay. Typing text is one thing, but fine mouse control, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, like I mentioned, they still make hardware for this machine. There are companies out there that their sole business is building things and making things for retro computers. And one of the coolest things that I have is this little guy. This is called an SD to IDC. The name doesn't really matter. You can see it even looks like an old Commodore disk drive. But what it is, is it allows you to use one of our little SD cards on these old pieces of equipment. And they work just like a real hard drive. So on here, this is an 8 gig hard drive. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of programs, games, everything like that instantly accessible to any of my Commodore. Oh, wow. So I don't have to fuss around with all the disks and everything like that. 
So, like I mentioned, people talk about IBM, people talk about Apple. People forget that companies like Commodore and companies like Atari were actually ahead of the game back in the early 80s. They were they would promote their products in, as inexpensive alternatives to these four and five thousand dollar computers that actually did more. But what happened is the business community would say, "Oh, it's a three hundred dollar computer. Oh, that can't. It's got to be a cheap one. You know, the boss wants this three thousand dollar computer." And they just never made it and succeeded in the business end of things. You know, lots of businesses used them, but they were generally delegated to home computers, doing home things, playing home games, things like that. And then in, uh, in the 90s, uh, Commodore just couldn't keep up. They come up with a new computer line called the Amiga, which maybe I'll talk about another time, but it was absolutely fantastic. That's what I based my, my channel on. Uh, but they just couldn't keep it up, and they ended up going bankrupt in uh, 94. And uh, one of the last products they discontinued in 94 when they went bankrupt was the Commodore 64. They were still making them back in 1994, just over 20 years ago. Wow. Um, so I have a lot of fun with it. I really enjoy it. I, I actually enjoy using these computers more than I enjoy sitting down in my nice, powerful i7 with 16 gigs of RAM at home. I'd rather sit down and have a good time playing on this. I program on them, play a few games. On my channel, what I do is I train people on how to use them, to, to, to remember how to use them, remember how to program, uh, remember how to utilize things like this Geos operating system. And, uh, I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. It keeps me out of trouble, too. Any questions? So do you find some of these like yard sales? You could get these at yard sales really commonly in the late 90s and early 2000s. You can find them all over the place. Pick them up for 10 bucks, 15 bucks. Starting in the mid-2000s, when the retro market really started taking off, they started getting harder to find, and people started asking more for them. Uh, like my big 20, I paid a hundred dollars for that. It had some other hardware with it, but I paid a hundred dollars for this. And my first one that my mom got me in 1981 was only 89 dollars, so <laughs> the price actually went up. Uh, Commodore 64s, 125, 150 dollars. Uh, Commodore 128s, 180 to 200 dollars. These are gold mine. These I see selling on eBay for. $600, $700, easy. I think mine up for 150 bucks, so I was really happy about that. And then are you reselling them? Do you buy them and resell them? I don't want to hold on. Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things I do resell. I refurbish uh, the external hard or external floppy drives for them, and I resell those. And some of the, the programs and other hard writing for them, I do resell those. But the actual core machines themselves, I, I like to have one that I use and kind of one as a backup if I need to steal parts from it, but I, I, I tend not to sell them very much anymore. That's okay. Do you have all these set up like in your office at home? I do. I have a, a, an office that's uh, fairly decent sized out in the garage, air conditioned office that we re refurbished two years ago. And I have all my equipment set up in there, and I also do all my video work in there. So if you look up uh, 10 Minute Amigo Retrocast on YouTube and watch a few of the videos, you'll actually see my office from different angles as I talk about different machines. And uh, I probably have uh, six, uh, probably about 15 to 18 retro computers that I, that, that at any point in time, I, I hook up and actually use. That's really cool. Do you advertise it on your Facebook page? Uh, I have a Facebook page, a 10, mark, or 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast Facebook page. Oh, you do? I don't promote it much. Most of my promotion is on Twitter. Uh, that's where I've talked to a lot of my friends on. Uh, and, and, uh, but yes, there are dedicated Facebook pages for the Commodore 64 and 128 and everything. I'm a member of that community. So. Cool. Thanks. Do you have like a wish list of products you're looking for? Like I was telling you before, my father collects all this stuff. We've had it since the 70s. Our first computer was a TRS-80. We have the K-Pro laptop. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they were similar to uh, we, we have the, the Commodore 64, we grew up with all of this, and my father has hoarded it. He's 85 years old, and my brothers are 
brothers and I are wondering, what are we going to do with all this stuff? I even bought this place. It's awesome. <laughs> 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 yeah, I love it. Our basement, I grew up in Nogales, and my father built the house, and our basement was just full of all of the places. Mm -hmm. as, as technology evolved, we, of course, had to have it. And he still has all that stuff. Oh, like, my holy 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 do you collect other brands other than the Commodore? Yeah, I've got uh, Texas Instruments uh, TI-99 4A, which is a popular computer back in the 80s. I've got a little Timex Sinclair computer that's about that big from about 1981. It's a little tiny thing with this little yucky keyboard. It's no longer my grandfather. I'm impressed that you know all the like nice things and the dates and the years and the... I have a hard time with my kids. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever... No. Did you go to the fair and they that what was it the love connection thing that big central processing system mm -hmm. card and, and i just kind of saw cool the lights and pictures. did you know about scion computers the little tiny mini mm -hmm. i have those oh yeah, i nice. love those yeah. those are like the coolest it's like a little tiny laptop you have one too yeah, this i'm gonna have you yeah, yeah. I, have, yeah. I, have, I had a couple of them yeah. jim had them they're great and then the phones came out and they did everything. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah, sure. I enjoyed so much. And fun. And yeah. Thank you, yeah. Jerry. Yeah. 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 You know, for those of you that have seen yeah. Apollo 11, I mean, uh, things, they would have died for one of these. Oh, yeah. Absolutely died for one of these. I mean, that was what they could have done to get themselves back with a, with a reasonable computer. I mean, yeah, this, this had. Know so much more power and so much more technology than the computers that took us to the moon. Yeah. It's, it was just incredible. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, these were just so far beyond that. That mm -hmm. mm -hmm. great. great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. 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 Anybody? Questions, comments, confusions? We'll see everybody in two weeks.